Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention for a moment, please. It's an extraordinary privilege to be able to introduce to you the Honorable Travis Laster, Vice Chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery. And I sincerely and devoutly wish, pray, and hope that the only time you meet this fine young gentleman <laughs> is on his visits here to Silicon Valley, and you never have occasion to see him wearing his black robe sitting in justice in Wilmington, Delaware. Because if you meet Travis under those circumstances, one of the main reasons why we're here today suggests that we failed, all right? Um, the, the best kind of litigation is the litigation that never happens. Um, the best kind of dispute is the one that's either avoided or relatively easily resolved. With that by way of background, let me just take a moment or two to share some personal observations um, uh, about uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Laster. Um, he's an extraordinary intellect, and he's got a very, very creative mind. And I'll just speak about uh, one or two specific observations. We're going to spend a lot of time in our last session talking about a decision called Trados. And here in Silicon Valley, the decision is controversial for many, many different reasons. It's also long, all right, for many, many different reasons. It clocks in at about, what, 120 pages? Okay. But one of the things that's really interesting about the decision is it's extraordinarily learned. It is the best single decision explaining how Silicon Valley venture capital process actually works. And if you wanted to have someone come in and say, well, all right, this is how companies tend to get built and tend to get operated, and this is what happens when a company starts going sideways, all right, it's not like we're selling it for $19 billion to Facebook, all right, over, you know, beer and chips, all right, one day. But the more common situation that actually happens here in Silicon Valley, it's a great story. And the best parts of the story sometimes are buried in the footnotes. Read the footnotes, all right? The footnotes have some very, very insightful and wry observations about the way Silicon Valley actually works. And speaking of footnotes, uh, the vice chancellor um, has a propensity on occasion to write very revealing dicta. Dicta are observations that aren't really necessary for the outcome of the case. And, and the vice chancellor has shared a couple of pearls in this way. And one of his major pearls that's actually been personally extraordinarily helpful to me is he shared some observations about the possibility that companies could put forum selection clauses uh, in their charters and later in their bylaws. And it's turned out that that observation has led to a small revolution in a corner of corporate law where more and more corporations are actually going public. And in fact, our latest data here at Stanford show that 67% of IPOs of companies chartered in Delaware now have forum selection provisions that say if there's going to be an intra-corporate dispute, if there's going to be a lawsuit among we shareholders and with the corporation, we're going we're to litigate that lawsuit in Delaware, and we're not going to have it hurt here in California or any place else. And it was in part because of, of the vice chancellor's observation that this technique has gone from essentially zero prior to 2010 to 67% market penetration. This is essentially unheard of. This is unprecedented in the area of the law. And again, it comes because of uh, some of the vice chancellor's uh, very innovative observations. So with that, by way of an overly long introduction, ladies and gentlemen, I humbly and modestly introduce you to one of the most powerful and creative forces in corporate law today, the Honorable Vice Chancellor. So it's uh, very nice to be here with you all. I'm glad to have Joe vouching for me because I have none of the requisite Silicon Valley credentials. I'm not an engineer, never been an entrepreneur, and I haven't either gone uh, public or declared bankruptcy. So you all would have no reason at all to listen to anything that I say but for uh, Joe's kind uh, endorsement. So what I, the other thing that always makes me humble um, when I address a group of actual directors and decision makers is I'm reminded about how little Delaware law actually has to say about the business of managing a company. 
So all I hope to do is leave you with two core insights into how a Delaware court on those rare instances when we actually evaluate how you've done in that job, how we will approach our task. <clears throat> it's hopefully no surprise to you that Delaware law has very little to say about how to run a company. The central premise of Delaware law is embodied in section 141A is that the board of directors runs a company, not a reviewing court. As a result, it's the board of directors that makes key decisions on things like designing a product, R&D investment, hiring employees, evaluating employees, your marketing plan, customer service. We could keep brainstorming a long, long list. Now, this isn't to say that the law has nothing to say on these issues. It's just to say that Delaware law has nothing to say on these issues. <clears throat> what Delaware law is in the corporate arena is Delaware law is a specific form of contracting. It's an entity uh, specific form of specialized contracting that is designed to govern the relationships among some of those inputs into the corporate structure. And those inputs are capital and the management teams. So the board of directors as the, as the overseer and also the officers. That's what Delaware law is about. Most substantive aspects of the corporation's existence are regulated by the substantive areas and the, and the jurisdiction in which the corporation operates. So your relationships with your employees are regulated by California law and by federal law. They're not regulated by Delaware law. We try to stick to our knitting in the corporate area. We ultimately have a, 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 humble, a humble goal. And I apologize, I, the, this shows you that Joe has put me to a lot of work this week. When I, when I came out here at the beginning of the week, I actually had a voice. But uh, you all have been very good hosts and you've uh, been able to talk to me. I'm, I also can promise you that I don't think I'm patient zero because I have no other, no other symptoms. But uh, <laughs> needless to say, uh, you'll have to bear with me in terms of my, my hoarseness for my speech today. <clears throat> so because it's an entity an entity-specific and specialized form of contract law, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what is the contract? That's the, the seminal thing that you want to know. And the contract for Delaware law has several constituent parts. The first and most important part is, of course, the Delaware General Corporation law itself. That is read into every one of your entities that's a Delaware corporation. And it's primarily a set of default terms. It does have some mandatory terms, but it's primarily a set of default terms. And the idea behind that is that you can tailor your specific corporate contract for whatever the needs of your entity are. Now, where do you tailor the specific terms of your corporate contract? You do that in the next level, which is the Certificate of Incorporation. And this is, of course, the fundamental document uh, for your corporation. To amend it, you need both the board and the stockholders. Pretty much anything can go in there. But because it requires both board and stockholder approval, it's fairly hard-baked, so all your most important contractual and uh, inter-constituency uh, 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 agreements should go in there. The third level, of course, is the bylaws. There are some things under the DGCL that can't go in the bylaws. Elimination of written consent can't go in the bylaws. But generally speaking, whatever you could put in the charter, you could also put in the bylaws. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Bylaws always can be amended by stockholders. You can put a high vote requirement on it. You can put a high quorum requirement on it, but they always can be amended by stockholders. So it's a much more malleable contract. If you want something that is baked in and protected, it needs to be at the charter level. <laughs> now what we've discussed so far are the explicit terms of the contract. But there's also another key aspect of it, and that's the implicit terms. And the most important implicit terms that you all have to come to grips with is fiduciary duty. Fiduciary duty is nothing more than a gap filler that recognizes that as these entities go out in the world and you as the board or you as officers of the entities encounter new things, it is physically impossible at the outset, ex ante as our academic friends like to say, to foresee all possible future, future states of the world and contract for them. If we all sat around even with all the experience and high-powered intellect in this room, 
we could not fully contract for them because we could not anticipate what one of the uh, uh, you know, wonderful inventors out there who's not in this room is going to do three weeks from now or a year from now, and you all are going to have to react to. We just don't know. So what fiduciary duties say is that when you have taken other people's money, you have an obligation to manage their money for their benefit, regardless of what circumstances may come down the line. And you have to encounter those circumstances and do what is in the best interests of your beneficiary. But to say there's a fiduciary duty to a beneficiary is only the starting point. The key questions you have to ask are, what do those fiduciary duties entail? And who is the beneficiary? And this is one of the 30,000 foot issues that I hope you take away from this talk. Under Delaware corporation law, the fiduciary is the corporation, I'm sorry, the, the beneficiary, your duties run to the corporation for the benefit of the undifferentiated stockholders. That means the common. So your job is to increase the overall value of the firm for the ultimate benefit of the undifferentiated equity, i.e. the common. Your job is not to benefit fixed claimants or contractual claimants. So your job is not to exercise duties in favor of employees. Your, duty, your job is not to exercise duties in favor of suppliers. Your job is not to exercise duties in favor of customers. And I know this may come as a shock. Your job is not to exercise duties in favor of the preferred when what the preferred is asserting is a contractual right. A preferred is a hybrid security. It has a contractual aspect that's specified, boom, 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 preferences, voting rights, other types of provisions, conversion rights. And then it has necessarily lots of gray areas where because they're not specified, it participates pro rata or equally with the common. Nothing specified, therefore, it has the same rights as the common. Your duties run to the equity as a whole because they're the last ones uh, in the chain, in the, in the capital stack. They're the last ones who get anything. So your job is to maximize their ultimate share of the pie. Now, this isn't like a cramped, crazy notion that you have to make short-term or near-term decisions to benefit the common. We understand, you all understand, everybody understands, if you don't have these other corporate constituencies, you don't have any value for the common. So it is of course true that you can do things like offer a customer discount, right? Maybe in the short term, that reduces the theoretical amount of revenue that if you were to distribute everything today would be benefited to the common. Is that a problem under a, Del um, a, under a common value maximizing principle? Of course not. Of course not. You can, of course, benefit employees. You can, of course, think about your suppliers. You can, of course, think about what's good about the com community. But these are all instrumental. These are all instrumental questions as to how do we build the greatest value to the corporation possible, which ultimately inures to the common. Subsidiary point, when I say inure to the common, I don't mean the people who happen to be common owners. So this is more of a public company point, but in the securities laws, the securities laws, particularly security fraud 10b-5, they worry about people who own a, spe a species of property that happens to be common stock, and they worry about people getting defrauded or deprived of their property through some artifice and you're really worried about the people, the humans, or, the, or the, the corporate humans, who are the owners of this special type of property right. Our Delaware view is somewhat different. We want you to maximize the value of the property. So think of that maximizing the value of the equity. That should help you solve questions of, okay, well, if I do a dividend now, maybe it's more beneficial for my controller personally uh, because of his tax treatment. So he's a stockholder. Isn't it true that I'm benefiting my stockholders by doing this now? 
Well, no, you might be benefiting the person who holds the stock. But you need to think about whether you're benefiting the value of the shares and maximizing the property right of the shares. Second subsidiary point, maximizing the value of the equity doesn't mean some sense of maximizing always over the short term. What it means is that we expect you all to build value over the long term. And what do I mean by long term? I mean perpetual. The default under Delaware law is that a corporation has a perpetual existence. Can you contract for a lesser time? Can you put in your charter that this corporation will dissolve in 10, 15 years, even 100 years? Sure you can. And in fact, a lot of your funds in the analogous uh, LLC acts provide the same thing. They provide for limited life. So you could do this, but the default is perpetual. And the default investment horizon for capital, perpetual. So when you put in common stock, you don't have a default ability to redeem. Not only that, but there are statutory restrictions on your ability to be redeemed. And if you bargain for a special redemption right, that falls under the category of those contractual rights, not your stockholder rights. So what does this mean? What is the answer to, and again, this is as much of a, of a um, public company issue as it is uh, for, for you all. What is the answer to people who say, oh, we know we're worried about short-termism. We're worried about people focusing too near term. Not if you're doing your job under Delaware law. If you're doing your job under Delaware law, it's almost like the American Indian idea of thinking seven generations ahead. You're actually supposed to be thinking as if you're the part of a perpetual entity. Now, does that mean that you can't take short-term opportunities? Of course not. If, for example, you're in uh, buggy whips and you can see that the car is coming, and if, for example, you are operating your buddy buggy whip company during a time when the Fed and the shadow banking sector are pumping overwhelming amounts of capital into the economy and subsidizing borrowing rates so that you can take frothy valuations beyond anyone's expectation, even though you know this thing is probably not going to have that much of a long-term future? Sell. That is a short-term decision, but it's a short-term decision based on the idea that the value that you can get in the near term exceeds what you can get by continuing to operate this company and looking at the present value of your best estimate of its cash flows over time. Now, nobody should think from that either that anybody's going to second guess you on your DCF valuation. We're going to let you exercise judgment as to whether and when to sell in terms of fulfilling this standard. And this is the next issue that I want to get to and the, hopefully the other big take home that you have today. And that's how does Delaware review how you're doing as directors? So I've just told you what I think your job is. What I think your job is, is to maximize the value of your companies. And to maximize the value of your companies on, by default, a long-term basis for the benefit, by default, of the ultimate residual holders. And that rising tide should lift all boats. But how am I going to decide how to do this? So let's take a speeding analogy. Let's assume that the job in speeding, uh, when you're driving your car, is to drive at a safe speed. That's your job. You are driving 40 miles per hour in a zone that is a 35 mile per hour zone. When I ask and review your decisions, do I take that type of standard and look and see, well, you know, were you five miles over the speed limit, one mile per hour speed limit? Worse yet, do I make my own decision about what a safe speed was and then say, well, actually, you're driving 36 and I think it was 35. None of that. What we do, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. What we do very simply is we start out and we look for a disinterested decision maker, a disinterested corporate decision maker. And if we find one, 
we defer to that disinterested corporate decision maker. And this gets back to the very first principle I outlined at the front. You don't want courts deciding how to run your company. You guys are in charge of running your companies. That is all there is to the business judgment rule. The business judgment rule simply says if we can look and we can see that there is a disinterested set of people that made this decision, they get to decide. We worry about conflicts. Why do we worry about conflicts? We worry about conflicts because I said to Joe on Monday, you guys have invented a lot of good things. You've got a lot of innovations. At least as far as I can tell, you haven't innovated your way out of human frailty. And the reality is that, you know, no person is a good judge of their own performance. We all think we did a pretty good job, or maybe a little bit better job than we think we should have. I often remind attorneys uh, when uh, they're in, we're in the pretrial conference, <clears throat> going into trial, studies have shown each side thinks they have a 70% chance of prevailing in the case. You know, if I asked who here thinks they're above average drivers, there'd be a lot of us who'd raise our hand. So we worry about conflicts for precisely that reason. <clears throat> there are some situations that our Delaware Supreme Court has identified as essentially coming up with inherent conflicts. They're not inherent conflicts that uh, are um, uh, completely pernicious, but they're tough decision-making situations. One of those tough decision-making situations is selling a company. There's just a lot of hydraulic pressure. There's a lot of claims to the same pie. There's a lot of personal dynamics that going on. There's a lot of relationships in play. So when you are in that situation, we're not happy just looking and saying, yeah, these guys over here, they're independent, they're disinterested, whatever they say goes, we're not going to second guess it. When you're in that situation, we ask and we expect you ought to be able to come forward and give us an explanation that is reasonable. Under the business judgment rule standard, all I have to do is look at these fellows and think, you know what? They could have had some good reasons for it. All they have to do is be rational. Even if they didn't have those standards, I don't get so, those reasons, I don't get so far as to actually ask what their reasons were. I just think, could they have had some good reasons? Sure. Under this standard that I'm talking about now, enhanced scrutiny, under specific situations like a sale, I need you all to show me that you have good reason. And that's where things like having a coherent exp explanation comes in. That's where things like having good minutes comes in. That's like things like where things that not having changes of position come in. That's what I need to hear. Now, <clears throat> if the plaintiffs can show that at least half of the directors really do have a conflict of interest, that's when we shift to entire fairness. Entire fairness is simply a tighter band than reasonableness. So think of these like a Mayan pyramid. On the bottom, we've got the business judgment rule. And this is a big base because it's rationality. It's probably wider than these two walls. You step up to reasonableness, you're probably as broad as this stage get to entire fairness, there's still play in the joints, but we're probably about where this podium is. You guys need to convince me that not only did you follow a reasonable course, but odds on, in fact, pretty close to certainty, you were right. You got to convince me. Now again, I understand that hindsight is 2020. I understand that things come out in discovery. I understand that there are plaintiffs that are trying to show that you all are a bunch of idiots. But all that said, under entire fairness, you have a narrow band that you have to come into. That's really all there is to it. So what I would encourage you all to do, if you can get the business judgment rule situation, great. You have no problem. If you have disinterested directors in the room, great. You have no problems. But as I think you all have candidly recognized today, for a classic 
VC-backed company, that is going to be a difficult situation. That is going to be the rarity. Particularly when you're dealing with something like a fundraise or when you're dealing with something like a sale, you're automatically in one of those settings where there's hydraulic pressure and questions about relationships. So whenever you're in one of those situations, you should start out assuming that you're going to need to have an explanation that checks out. Doesn't mean it has to be the only way of doing things, but it has to be one reasonable way of doing things. I very much liked what I heard today about <clears throat> not locking in a funding source in a down round, not locking in a term sheet. What that credits is the idea that this is one way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. And we're going to find out whether there are other ways to do it. Now, if you get to the situation where, so you're always starting there. Now let's assume that because of, you know, trade style facts or personal relationships or whatever, you do not even have a majority of independent directors. In that situation, what I would like you all to do is just come in and tell me what you did. Tell me what you thought about. Don't run from your conflicts. If you all describe your conflicts like your, the panels were today, that's very credible. If you come in, though, and you deny that you even had a conflict, <laughs> first of all, it's really hard to me to believe that you're that naive. You guys are a bunch of smart people. But how can I have any confidence that you dealt forthrightly with a conflict? if you're denying that it even exists in the first place. So, one of the things that um, you know, Joe has asked a couple times this week is, is Silicon Valley different? How does Silicon Valley interact with Delaware, et cetera? I really don't think, I mean, you guys are, are doing great things out here. You're very different in some ways. I don't think you're very different when it comes to the question of conflicts. And I don't think you're very different when you come to the question of conflicts because you really are all human. And so all I would ask you to do and encourage you to do is when you get in one of these situations, deal with it candidly. And then when you come and are in a courtroom like mine, acknowledge it, tell me what you've done, tell me how you dealt with it. And generally speaking, I think you will have made the right decision. But there's no reason to buy the problems of credibility that arise when you deny the existence of a conflict, at least based on today, we all know is there. Don't buy that credibility problem. Take it on, explain what you did, and if you have a lot of confidence in what you did, that shouldn't be in a position where you feel exposed or worried. So, <clears throat> I apologize for my voice, it's crazy. So the two things I ask you to take away from today, two fundamental premises, I guess three fundamental premises. First, we are not trying to tell you how to run your business. And it would be incoherent with our premise of director-centric governance for us to tell you how to run your business. Second thing, though, is when you're running your business, what you have to focus on ultimately is growing the pie for the undifferentiated equity. The folks who are out the door because they were the last management team and they didn't get the job done, if they're still common stockholders, they are still people to whom you owe duties. If you want to solve that problem, deal with it in terms of vesting, deal with it in terms of buyback. Don't deal with it in terms of a cram down that doesn't take into account to any way their continuing equity stake. And then third and final thing, understand that when we come at this, our first question is, is there a disinterested decision maker? And then we're always modulating off that to figure out how much and to what degree conflicts may have played a role in the decision. The worst thing you can do is run from your conflicts. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Seeing none. Uh oh, one in the back. So you said the question um, what do you consider a independent director? 
So um, the the basic decision of an independent director is someone who can uh, consider and make a decision on the merits without any extenuating influences. Now, that is, it's sort of like the, uh, the jury of your peers. You're getting somebody who knows nothing about your situation to decide your case. Um, although that's the ideal, we take a practical look at it in um, uh, actual context. So um, the easiest thing to ask is, is this person getting some type of benefit that is different than what the stockholders as a whole are getting? That's what raises a direct loyalty issue. That's what, um, uh, then you shift to questions of, that's what raises the, the interestedness issue. Then you shift to the questions of independence. And there I look to, is there somebody who is getting differential treatment, who has sufficient influence over this individual such that you can reasonably question this individual's ability to make a disinterested decision on the merits. So what, that might, what might that be? Well, if, you're, um, if your child is the CEO, or if somebody else uh, on the board uh, is a member of your family, that's the, that's the situation that we've repeatedly hit. Um, the dual fiduciary problem that uh, was identified in Weinberger, if you owe fiduciary duties to an entity that is getting differential consideration, you face a conflict. You face conflicting legal pulls that are pulling you in different situations. That's a problem. Now, if that entity to whom you own duty, duties isn't getting differential treatment, then rather than creating a conflict, that creates alignment. The softer questions are issues of personal ties. So, you know, did this person go to, to college with the, the CEO? Um, to what degree have they uh, interacted regularly since then? Uh, to what degree um, you know, are their lives intertwined such that uh, someone could reasonably question their ability to make an objective decision? <clears throat> Once you get to the latter, it's very much a facts and circumstances question. It's also very much of a question that is going to turn on the stage of the case and the standard of review. So the first standard that I discussed, the business judgment rule, the plaintiff has the burden to come forward and show the existence of some type of conflict. Very tough. You've got to have specifics. So for business judgment rule context, the fact that you're appointed by a majority stockholder, not enough. Doesn't get you over the hurdle. You've got to show more. Contrast that if for some reason you're already in entire fairness. Like, let's say you're already doing um, you know, some type of, of self-interested transaction. Let's say it's, a, it's, it's some type of down round where out of five directors, three of them are going to participate and buy into the new security um, that's basically going to you know, recap everything and wipe everything else out. Under that scenario, where you're already going to be in entire fairness, because you've got three out of five interested, <clears throat> I'm going to look much more closely at the connections that that one individual has. Because that's a situation where it's much harder for that individual to come forward and hold up their hand and say, you know, no guys, this is, this is really wrong, or this is really unfair. So, easy standard to state. Can they make a decision on the merits? Easy standard to apply at some levels. Are they getting differential consideration? Do they have a dual fiduciary problem? After that gets fuzzy, facts and circumstances, and depends on uh, standard review and stage of the case. Yes, sir? Mike, I have a question about the conflict of interest of independent directors in an independent mm -hmm. context. Typically, venture directors do not receive any compensation for serving on the board. Is anticipation of our CEO or CEO or lack of outside directors who have compensation quite high, like hundreds, two hundred thousand dollars a year? Uh -huh. uh, every company goes public. Now trying to decide whether or not to sell to the company. The CEO is compensated. The outside directors are taking down one or two hundred thousand a year. Right. They'd like to see the party continue for as long as possible. Right. The venture directors might say it's time to sell the company. Do you speak to the issue of independent directors' conflict of interest where they played that highly in an MA transaction? So um
Um, and again, it's perhaps because we're become inured by public company comp uh, director compensation. But um, 100 to 200,000 is not the type of thing that in terms of director fees uh, would raise an eyebrow in terms of a conflict situation. Um, you would have to really come in and, and show something weird. Um, I don't know what it would be, but uh, particularly given the, the expectation that there'd be somewhere with all of these individuals, they're probably fairly substantial people uh, uh, as it is. And as I say, based on sort of what, what our sense is of uh, what people get paid for director's compensation, 100 to 200 in Delaware would not raise eyebrows. Um, you know, change that out of the scenario of regular annual director's fees uh, and shift it to some type of transaction related bonus or some event driven fee, you get different results from the numbers. I will not claim for a moment that our courts and our case law is consistent or coherent on this. But uh, generally speaking, sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars or below does not bat an eyelash. People will dismiss it. Uh, one hundred and twenty, one hundred and thirty thousand and above, generally seen to be material, at least enough to get past the pleading stage. In between, some cases go one way, some cases go the other way. Um, I used to, I used to joke about it. Our compensation's gone up then, but so I make one seventy. Uh, back when I think a lot of these cases were developed, like a 120 was about what the judges were making. So, so maybe now the, the materiality threshold is raised to 170. But, you know, it's pretty poor. Pretty poor. Pretty poor to non-existent. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I really appreciate it.